This is Corova Beach, North Carolina in the 1970s. That's my grandparents' place there. They had a place on Ocean Sands Drive, two lots south of Bass Lane, about a block south of the Virginia State Line. We used to go there a lot from the mid 70s to the mid 80s. It was a really cool place. One of the cool things you saw all the time there at Corova was stumps right there in the surf. Makes it pretty obvious when you see these ancient trees sticking out of the surf that come and go as the sand's washed away and covered. This place used to look a lot different hundreds or thousands of years ago. Another thing you see a lot there that comes and goes is shipwrecks. Sometimes really big shipwrecks. We saw tons of shipwrecks, some of them large, some of them small. But one question I would always ask my grandparents was, why are all these ships around here? Where were they going? My grandparents would always say something like, well, they didn't mean to be here. They just were blown here by a storm and wrecked. But I always wondered, why would ships be traveling around here? There was really nowhere for a ship to go in this area. There are pirates in my family, two of them, and they're mentioned in this book, Pirates on the Chesapeake. I was reading this book this past summer and I kept seeing references to the Currituck Inlet. I didn't know what that was, I'd never heard of it. So I started looking into it. What I found out was that the Outer Banks has lots of old inlets that are no longer around. Seems that this was more a group of barrier islands back then than it was a peninsula like it is now. But the inlet that interested me the most and really fascinates me is the Currituck Inlet, right there at the state line, right there what is now Corova Beach because I spent so much time there in the mid-70s to the mid-80s. If you want to know what the Currituck Inlet was like, you got to read some writings by this man, William Byrd. He was part of a group of commissioners and officials from the colonies of North Carolina and Virginia, who in 1728 undertook the job of running the boundaries between these two colonies. So in March 5th, 1728, that group of men stood right here at this beach and eventually drove a post in the sand and ran it due west to mark the boundaries between North Carolina and Virginia. The inlet looked something like this back in 1728. He described it as about a mile wide with sand points on each end and vegetation would start a little farther up. This is actually Oregon Inlet, our first most northern inlet on the Outer Banks today. We've also got some experience in seeing this process of inlets coming and going over the years. This is what's called New Inlet. In 2011, in late August, Hurricane Irene blew a hole in Pea Island and it created a new inlet. Now this new inlet is not actually that new because this new inlet spot has actually been opened up and closed several times over the last 150 years. But we got to see it firsthand in 2011. Uh, the state eventually built a temporary bridge over New Inlet so the cars could keep, keep on passing. And it became a spot we ended up surfing at a little bit for about a year and a half, two years. This is a video we took in January 2013, and as you can see in this video, New Inlet isn't much of an inlet anymore. It's closing up pretty fast. The New Inlet would eventually close in 2013. But as far as Currituck Inlet goes, one way other than William Byrd's writings to track its history is through maps. There's a bunch of maps that show Currituck Inlet beginning in 1584. This map here is the northernmost inlet on this map. Then we have this 1585 map, which north is facing right, and Currituck Inlet is the farthest one to the right. You'll notice Trinity Harbor mentioned on several of these maps in the late 1500s through the early 1600s. It was obviously an important harbor at the time. 
Eventually it would close up and Currituck Inlet would become the main inlet that larger ships would come in. They would sail into Currituck Inlet, head south around Knott's Island, then head up the Northwest River towards what was known as Port Currituck, which was somewhere around Moyoc. It was reported as late as the early 1800s that there was over 200 ships docked there. And as you'll notice as we go along in time with these maps through the now late 1600s, that Currituck Inlet gets a partner in the early 1700s. 1713, New Inlet opens up, which is about three or four miles south of Currituck Inlet. And by the 1728 expedition of William Byrd and Company, uh, no one was using Currituck Inlet anymore. They were using New Currituck Inlet, which was actually a much better location to have to avoid going all the way around Knott's Island. And as these maps go along, you'll eventually see Currituck Inlet close up completely. And in the later maps, it's just shown as a piece of land. You notice there's a small island right behind the piece of land at Corova. And eventually you're gonna see in modern Corova that piece of land of that island becomes all one piece with Corova Beach. It's joined by the marsh uh, of today. This is modern day Corova. You can see that island which was once behind the inlet is now part of the land right behind the main part of Corova Beach. Now back to Mr. William Byrd. He described the area around there at the time. He said there was very few trees, but cedars, and he described different types of vegetation, um, some evergreen shrubs, some different leaves that they use for tea, things like that. Um, but his description is really cool and he gives some pretty precise measurements on where the inlet would have started back in those days. One thing I didn't know was right just a couple blocks from my grandparents' place, I just discovered this past summer as well, was this monument in the woods right there at Corova, just south of the state line. This monument's commemorating the 1728 run that William Byrd was involved in, mentions the names of lots of the officials, things like that. And this monument was put up in 1887 when another different man re-ran the state lines and they put 28 of these stones throughout the, the states to mark the state lines. Anyway, it was been sitting there in the woods for over 100 years and it's a pretty cool piece of history. When this was marked in 1728 that was the edge of an inlet and now it's in the woods and here we go this is a spot of beach where the inlet would have started in 1728 just past the end of bass lane right there on the beach fast forward to the seven 1970s and you've just got vegetation everywhere here's a picture in 1991 of that same spot that's my grandparents' place grown over in 1991. And that's my grandparents' place in 2011. It's a forest now. You can't even see the trailer, which is still there somewhere. It's back in those woods. So, if you look at this map, this Google Earth map, you'll see where the inlet used to be. You can see the main part of Corova there. And going on the descriptions that William Byrd gave of where the inlet started, right about Bass Lane, and then it ran about a mile, it pretty much ran the length of Ocean Sands Drive. And there you go, I've taken the liberty of filling in the water with the island behind there, and then the far back was Knott's Island, but that's roughly where the inlet was in 1728. Corova was pretty much all underwater, and that's Corova Beach today the heart of it, and that's where the inlet was. Pretty cool. So anyway, next time you're at Corova Beach, or if you ever make it out there, look around and remember, this whole place was underwater a few hundred years ago. 
pretty slice of history.